I have been seeing information about the causes of autism all over social media, and I'm pleasantly surprised that our government and RFK is looking into this. We made a uh, note the other week that RFK said, tomorrow I will let you guys know the causes of autism. We've been looking into this since April. Here's an article from April that talks about how RFK was misleading about autism prevalence. No need to read the article from Fact Check, but basically he thinks it's an environmental toxin, and then it's a quote from a whole bunch of different experts, psychologists, psychiatrists that say, there's no way this is linked to an environmental toxin. And uh, I did not think that he was going to let us know anything significant, but he actually uh, said there's two things that they have found a link. Keyword link, which means correlation, not causation, for those that are familiar. And you have not seen it yet, so let's pull up the other uh, article. He did let us know the two causes. They are Tylenol in pregnancy and also folate deficiency in pregnancy. So this is another article from Newsweek that talks about some of the studies that show a link and some of the ones that doesn't. A study from Harvard, if uh, you go over to the Confluence page there, Cameron, um, here is the, the data. What are your initial thoughts before looking at the, the various studies? There's several of them, and there's a chart here that references them. But initial thoughts on autism, and they also found a link between ADHD and Tylenol use in pregnancy. Interesting. I, I am curious how all of the experts in the field came out and said, there's no way it's environment. Because if it's not the environment, then it's genetics. And if it's not genetics, then it's the environment. So you can't have it both ways. Um, but I think I've seen paper that shows a link, right, correlation with Tylenol and ADHD, but I had not seen this with regard to autism. Um, and the other one you said was a, a folate deficiency. Mm -hmm. I, I haven't looked at the paper, but that seems plausible that not having an optimal folic acid status would lead to uh, less than ideal neurological development and presumably could affect social interactions and mm -hmm. um, create this downstream sequelae. To play so, devil's advocate, diagnostic criteria has changed, which is certainly one of the causes why it appears to have increased incidence and prevalence. Um, if the diagnostic criteria were different 50, 70 years ago, then more people would have been diagnosed. Like for osteopenia, osteoporosis? I don't think those were invented until, what, several decades ago. Yeah. Um, and then the other note is uh, that the expert said it was not due to an environmental toxin. They still did acknowledge it, other environmental factors. But what he thought is that it was some sort of toxin. So I suppose um, there is, if you scroll down here to the, to the link, um, in the Environmental Health Journal, there was a Harvard study. But... Um, before that, if you go back to the confluence, there's three different kind of research groups. Studies from John Hopkins and Mount Sinai basically found a correlation. Um, study that was actually NIH funded uh, a little over a year ago. Uh, they did not find a causal link, but then there is a big, um, there's a couple different big meta-analyses, and they actually did find uh, associations as well. So I had an AI tool put together that study reference that either found an association or did not. And then there is also a different Swedish cohort study that did not find a link. However, if you look at the, uh, the main study that's referenced, which is the Harvard study, they did find a specific relationship between the exposure and the response. So many of the studies found this relationship. This is, um, you know, some people would say, well, uh, you know, taking Tylenol once a month, one time throughout your pregnancy is surely not going to cause enough oxidative stress in the brain to slow things. And I think that's probably true. Um, but if you take it frequently enough, I could see this being a causal link. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, there's, you can sort of people play this game with substances, right? If you have one alcoholic drink per month, is that going to do anything negative? Probably not. And you say, okay, what about two a month, three a month, four a month? There's a line somewhere that gets crossed with substances. And mm -hmm. I know you've said this before, and I 
tend to tell people the same thing when they're planning for conception, just sort of having things um, as re- as natural as is reasonable, right? Mm-hmm. So certain people, we don't want them to go off all of their medications, but certainly eliminating prescriptions that are um, cosmetic in nature, right? Mm-hmm. So if you look at something like a tretinoin or a topical retinoid, right? Probably a good idea. Just pause that, right? You're not going to mm-hmm. do that during pregnancy. Probably let it wash out of your system preconception. And there's a million examples you could use of things like that. So I, I think as natural as is reasonable is the slogan that I tend to mm-hmm. use in my approach to health in general and specifically this sort of preconception. Mm-hmm. I've said this many times on podcast, but when it comes to prenatal care and actually delivery as well, as time passes and I get more and more experience of which I have been um, uniquely involved with uh, hundreds if not thousands of cases of prenatal care and hundreds of deliveries uh, myself, and even more if you count uh, experience with colleagues um, doing prenatal care and delivery, the more natural the better, unless there is a pathology that arises, then address the pathology. C-section is another good example of this. A scheduled C-section that's a little bit early, so the um, physician can go on vacation a bit early, probably not a great reason to do a induction or a C-section early. And you know, for many reasons, a lot of people do schedule C-sections and a lot of them just don't care because the way they think about it is I can get a healthy baby this way. They're not worried about the microbiome or the risk of Crohn's disease, you know, 50 years later in their child. They're worried about, well, what can I do that's safe and healthy right now? And according to them, you know, there's no downsides to, you know, just scheduling up an elective C-section. I know many people, including doctors and nurses that have done this. And on an individual basis, then maybe that's true. But again, on a population level, um, these things are making a pretty pretty big difference. Yeah. It's like embracing technology, right? There's good things that technology can do, and medicine is a form of technology. And there's also a, a point where it's too much, right? So mm-hmm. being able to pick up a phone and call somebody across the world, mm-hmm. right? Life-changing, world-changing, whenever that happens. But yeah having a screen with 60 second TikToks that you can be glued to eight hours, 10 hours, 12 hours a day, probably not such a great thing, right? So the technology is sort of, or the adoption of the technology is the problem, the implementation. And I think the data is actually very clear on like, if you look at C-section versus natural birth cohorts that there's a lot of benefits. And that's not to say someone can't have a healthy baby through C-section and there's no guarantee that that child is going to grow up to have problems. But if you look at the probability and what would set up that child for the most optimal health span, mm-hmm. it's probably not starting with an elective C-section. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, if you scroll down a little bit beneath the, or actually up a little bit, there's a couple different uh, causation uh, links. So further during prenatal development, there's a lot of epigenetic changes. That's definitely the case. And, uh, Tylenol does cross um, into the fetal circulation, into the fetal brain. So it could be that, you know, there's a lot of these oxidative stress, oxidative damages. And that's why if someone overdoses in Tylenol, especially if they're a child, then you're going to treat them with NAC, which is a glutathione precursor. It's one of the three amino acids in glutathione. So, and uh, many other things as well. But uh, I can't help but think that... um, you know, there's there's probably more that we should be counseling pregnant patients on. Uh, in fact, the authors of the main paper that's referenced, the Harvard paper, they say use as little as possible. They're not completely against use during pregnancy, but using as little as possible. Another interesting mechanism was via the enzyme CYP2E1. So that's present in a lot of locations. And um, it can potentially produce more toxic metabolites as well. So, um, you know, a, this is probably not the only toxin that leads to increased prevalences of ADHD and autism spectrum disorder. But uh, I did want to touch on folate as well. So, um, people know that a, a grade A recommendation, a very strong recommendation, one of the strongest is to take a prenatal vitamin. And those have folate in them. So how, how is this still an issue? Yeah, I assume the cohorts um, probably are done at several different academic institutions and they have a variety of um, 
SES status populations. So seeing like lower SES status or people who are um, upper SES status, but very um, so much naturalistic that they mm -hmm. won't even do a prenatal vitamin. Yep. They want to get it all through diet or all through food without kind of an insurance policy there when you have things like morning sickness or in the extreme case, right, mm -hmm. hyperemesis, yep. you know, where you you're can't keep nutrition down. And that prenatal is going to be pretty important. And yep. notoriously, they do cause nausea because it has a lot of things mm -hmm. in there at high doses. And people I don't think like to take them, but it's a sacrifice they make for the good of yeah. their child. And those people can take things like sublingual uh, dissolving folate. So there's folate lozenges you can take. There's better forms of folate. They can use alcohol. Swabs. If, if you smell the alcohol swabs, it takes away the nausea. Yeah. Folinic acid, uh, L-methylfolate, which is um, is fine to take during pregnancy. There used to be kind of a controversy about that. But um, yeah, hopefully they're not ingesting the alcohol swab. Uh, yeah, not to ingest, just to smell. Other good quick takeaways with folate. Capsules are absorbed better than tablets. So if your prenatal vitamin is a tablet, especially if you're getting nausea, switch to a capsule. You can take less. Switch to a form that has more folate. Have a physician like us or a nurse practitioner that actually checks your folate level and homocysteine. And if you want methylmalonic acid, if you're really worried about how much active folate um, you're getting. And then uh, past that, uh, foods do foods are good sources of folate. If you're exercising frequently, you're going to eat more and get more folate. Folate's one of the things that's kind of hard to get. You know, you think of selenium. You, have, you can have a lot of Brazil nuts and kind of load up on that. And there's iron-rich foods, but lots of different foods that are good sources of folate. There's not many mega sources of folate, if that makes sense. And two things, actually three things, can really deplete your food of folate. Boiling them, unfortunately, depletes folate levels a ton, up to half. So that fortified pasta is mm -hmm. not as fortified as we might think. Processing them really depletes folate levels as well. Um, and if you think about, um, you know, a vegetable, you're probably not going to want to consume it raw, but steaming them is a really good alternative. So um, we'll link a study up here that shows that steaming them is actually a much better, um, way to, um, not deplete your food of folate. So your food probably has a decent amount of folate, but if you can only eat 1500 calories a day because you're on the couch all day, then that's half the amount of food of someone who's exercising all the time that eats 3,000 calories a day. Um, I know my wife, Maddie, eats an insane amount of food all the way through pregnancy. And she doesn't love taking her prenatal vitamin. She'll take a capsule from time to time. And she has had significant nausea. But we try to eat relatively fresh food. Storing food um, will also deplete it. So you process it and deplete it. Then you boil it and deplete it. And then you store it and you deplete it. That's a pretty bad combination. Um, so yeah, I think those are some good takeaways and that uh, a lot of people say, oh, well, the, we're not growing enough, you know, high folate foods or whatnot. You can go to a farmer's market and there's, uh, you can get a pretty good, uh, spread of high folate foods. Yeah. Or if you look into, you know, futurism, maybe instead of fortifying existing foods, you just like, you know, make the rice that's like a multivitamin, right? That's mm -hmm. something that's been done and being done in some of the develop, not developed, but the developing world. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's potential there depending on how GMO or non-GMO you want your food. Yeah. Um, I think something we can put in the uh, show notes for this and in the link, the description is the sublingual vitamins. I forget the manufacturer, but they now have an iron. So for people that don't mm -hmm. absorb iron particularly well, um, or B vitamins for that matter, you have mm -hmm. these sublingual films. Um, so if nausea is a problem, it's going to go right into the bloodstream. Yep. So I think we can link to that as something actionable and useful. And I'm going to ask you to speculate a bit. Like this is all fine and dandy. It's sort of an acute sort of correlation. Mm -hmm. But something more exciting to me would be uh, transgenerational inheritance. So mm -hmm. if you think about uh, someone who's autistic, you know, what was their grandmother potentially exposed to? Do you think that crossed the, uh, thinking specifically like a female uh, autistic individual? Yeah. Do you think that crossed this administration's mind in their search where they're thinking, because, I mean, chemicals. Kind of like DES back in the day. There's more of them now, but they're more regulated. There's a lot of things that you just have no clue what the impact is until later. 
So thinking mm -hmm. of what people today that are autistic, what their grandmothers were exposed to, that's interesting to me. And maybe mm -hmm. I'm just picking that because they didn't put that in their report. Yeah, we know this is the case with some chemicals and right. perhaps Secondhand it's also smoke, the case smokers. with, you know, it's gonna be the case with uh, smartphones or AI. This, was your grandmother exposed to this? Not because of the EMFs, but because <laughs> because of just the the habit of doing this and getting set in this epigenetic pattern. But yeah, I'm, I'm sure that there is, given that um, we recently have had, you know, the industrial age and then um, the uh, computerization. There's a lot of different unique exposures. I know there's this new phenomenon called the Parkinson's belt, and we're trying to figure out why people in this specific area of the country tend to get Parkinson's more often. So I love that our government is presumably doing of something of what it should, which is protecting us and looking for these causes and saying, hey, this is a, um, a correlation. We're looking for a cause. We found a link. We found a correlation. And then it leaves it up to the um, individual or hopefully leaves it up to the individual <laughs> doctor and nurse practitioner to say, hey, here's some actionable takeaways that you can do in order to be healthier, especially preventively. Yeah. And this isn't us saying that we want, you know, women to suffer and never take a Tylenol the whole pregnancy, but it's just information to participate in shared decision making or individual decision making. If someone like these are over the counter, so you don't necessarily have to have a doctor's permission to take Tylenol. Like obviously if someone's mm -hmm. pregnant should um, look at a list and, and think about what over the counter things they can and should or shouldn't be taking during pregnancy. Mm -hmm. um, but it's just information so people can take a listen and hopefully there's some good takeaways. And like, I think these sublingual forms are, are really helpful for people. Um, you know, I think that may be the biggest um, sort of practice changer for me is like the sublingual iron now, because some, some people like, you know, you can supplement them with oral all day long and mm -hmm. it, you're just not going to improve the ferritin levels. Not everybody has the access to resources for IV iron, mm -hmm. but almost everybody has an Amazon account at this point, yes. depending on how much they like or hate Jeff Bezos. <laughs> yeah. And there's other places to get it other than Amazon as well. Yeah. So we'll leave some of those links below and uh, hopefully this gives people a lot of actionable takeaways to give them a more balanced approach for health. As always, they can uh, leave comments below if they agree or disagree, or um, you can also leave a comment for the algorithm if you didn't listen, but you were just upset that we talked about this topic. <laughs> it still helps, still helps us. Yeah. As always, uh, thank you for your time and thank you for watching. May God bless you with health and happiness.